If you consume a lot of information about the power of stress to cripple you, you will perform worse. There's absolutely no question. The data are striking. The famous neurosurgeon has a fantastic point to make here. It's super important to break free from the stress cage we often find ourselves in. You know, feeding your brain the wrong info can actually make things worse. So be mindful of your thoughts and what you let enter your mind, because it can really impact how stress affects you. Stick with us in this video, and we're going to show you just how true that is. We hear all the time that stress is bad. We hear people saying they're really stressed out. The stress response is in part organized to combat bacterial and viral infection. And this to me is just not discussed enough, so that's why I'm discussing it here. An ability to control your levels of stress in real time is extremely powerful. Your breathing can directly impact your heart rate and your level of stress or calm. You might be surprised to hear that something as simple as your breathing can actually have a major impact on your stress levels. I mean, just picture how freeing normal breathing could be when you're constantly letting stress take over your body without even considering what you're feeling or reacting to. That can really easily spiral out of control. And your poor heart rate ends up taking the brunt end of it, which is why it's essential to understand what he's trying to talk about. Anything that you do and experience, but especially stress, is the consequence of that thing and what you believe about that thing. If you consume a lot of information about the powers of stressful states to bring out your best, you will perform better. And this is not growth mindset. This is just simply what sorts of, what do you believe about stress based on the dominant knowledge that you're consuming about it. So that's why it's fun to watch David Goggins. Here we go again. When you start to consume a lot of that information, it's not just inspiring, it actually changes your perception of what your own stressful states mean. You can actually get better from stress if you're in the ocean of knowledge that stress grows you. Isn't it pretty cool that the doctor mentions David Goggins' videos? Because seriously, that kind of content can totally transform your mindset, both directly and indirectly. And who knows, maybe even watching this video is sparking some changes inside you right now. With all the valuable information at your fingertips, adopting a new mindset is the key to success and achieving your goals. So make sure to watch this video to the end and learn about how to turn stress into fuel, rather than letting it weigh you down like an anchor. You've all presumably heard the arguments or the framework that stress is this horrible ancient carryover from times in which humans were pursued by animals or other human predators and gosh, what an unfortunate thing. And we have so many creature comforts nowadays, but we have not eliminated this stress, almost as if it was like an organ or a system in our body that was bad for us, that we're stuck with just because of the species that we are. It is entirely naive for us to think that in ancient times, of course, there were infidelities, right? Partners cheated, people died. In fact, before the advent of phones, you can imagine that someone might head off on a hunt or to go visit a relative and never come back and you would never know why. That would be very s stressful. So there was psychosocial stress. There was the stress of losing loved ones. There was the stress of cold, of famine. There was the stress probably also of just worry. So all the problems that we're struggling with existed forever. It's just that stress at its core is a generalized system. It wasn't designed for tiger tigers attacking us or people attacking us. It's a system to mobilize other systems in the brain and body. That's what stress really is. It's designed to be generic. And that's the most important thing that I'd like you to understand today is that the system that governs what we call stress is generic. It wasn't designed for one thing. And there are hardwired biological mechanisms, meaning cells and chemicals and pathways and tissues that exist in you right now that require no neural plasticity that allow you to put a break on stress. So you have a system for stress and you have a system for de-stress that are baked into you. They were genetically encoded and they, you were born with them and you still have them now. Well, let's just distinguish between stressors, which are the things that stress us out, and stress, which is the psychological and physiological response to stressors. So stress, and as I mentioned before, is generic. It doesn't distinguish 
between physical and emotional stress. So what happens when the stress response hits? Let's talk about the immediate or what we call the acute stress response. We could also think of this as short-term stress. You have a collection of neurons. They have a name. It's called the sympathetic chain ganglia, and it has nothing to do with sympathy. Sympa means together, and there's a group of neurons that start right about at your neck and run down to about your navel, a little bit lower, and those are called the sympathetic chain ganglia. When something stresses us out, either in our mind or because something enters our environment and we see something that stresses us out that we don't like, heights if you're afraid of heights, somebody you dislike walks into the room, etc. that chain of neurons becomes activated like a bunch of dominoes falling all at once. It's very fast. When that happens, those neurons release a neuromodulator called acetylcholine. They release that at various sites within the body. When those neurons are activated, acetylcholine is released, but there's some other neurons. Those ones respond to that acetylcholine and then they release epinephrine, which is the equivalent to adrenaline. And the stress response is in part organized to combat bacterial and viral infection. There are pathways from the same brain centers that activate these uh, neurons in your, in your spinal cord to make you feel like you want to move. There are other neurons in your brain that activate things like your spleen, which will deploy killer cells to go out and scavenge for incoming bacteria and viruses and try and eat them up and kill them. So short-term stress and the release of adrenaline in particular, or epinephrine, same thing, adrenaline, epinephrine, is good for combating infection. When you inhale, your diaphragm moves down. This creates more space in your thoracic cavity and your heart actually gets a little bit bigger. As a consequence, the rate of blood flow through that larger heart volume slows down. A signal is sent from a group of neurons on your heart called the sinoatrial node. That signal goes up to the brain and your brain sends a signal to speed the heart up. In other words, inhaling speeds your heart rate up. When you exhale, your diaphragm moves up. Your heart gets a little bit smaller because there's a little bit less space in your thoracic cavity. As a consequence, blood flows more quickly through that smaller volume. The sinoatrial node registers that and sends a signal to your brain, and the brain sends a signal to slow the heart down. So if you want to speed up your heart rate and be more alert, inhale more or make those inhales more vigorous more intense. If you want to calm down, you can do that quickly by making your exhales slightly longer than your inhales or making them more vigorous. This doesn't require any breath work. This is something that you can do in real time. And that's what's called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. That's the technical phrase. It's also the basis of what's called heart rate variability or HRV. But all you need to remember is inhaling deeper and longer will speed your heart rate up. Exhaling longer and more intensely will slow your heart rate down and will allow you to calm down in real time. The use of, again, respiration, breathing, to somewhat artificially activate the stress response, the dilation of the pupils, the changes in the optics of the eyes, the quickening of the heart rate, the sharpening of your cognition, and in fact, that short-term stress brings certain elements of the brain online that allow you to focus Now, it narrows your focus. You're not good at seeing the so-called big picture, but it narrows your focus. It allows you to do these, what I call duration path outcome types of analysis. It allows you to evaluate your environment, evaluate what you need to do. It primes your whole system for better cognition. It primes your immune system to combat infection. And that all makes sense when you think about the fact that famine, thirst, bacterial infections, viral infections, invaders, all of this stuff liberates a response in the body that's designed to get you to fight back about against whatever stressor that happens to be psychological physical bacterial viral again the stress response is generic if you're in the ocean of living in the ocean of knowledge i was seeing like a pool in the summer you got the kiddie pool the kids all peeing in it presumably (laughs) you got the diving thing you got the high dive and all that if you believe that the experience of belly flopping off the high dive is going to make you a better diver in some sense it at least in this analogy, it will. Whereas if you feel that it's just the most embarrassing thing ever and it's going to cripple your ability to get out in the dive in front of anybody ever again, well, you're you're right about that too. <laughs>